Welcome everyone. My name is David Wood and I chair London Futurists. We're living in fairly remarkable times. We might say we're living in exponential times with an accelerating pace of change. This online webinar, which I'm pleased that you've all joined, was announced only three days ago. But during these three days, events have already changed rapidly. Until yesterday, the most deaths from COVID-19 in the UK that had happened in any one day was 56. Yesterday, the deaths in the previous 24 hours in the UK were announced as rising to 87. And just a few minutes ago today, the deaths for the previous 24 hours in the UK were announced as 113 more. In America, the number of people claiming unemployment insurance has just jumped sky high. Around the world, politicians are proposing solutions that until recently would have seemed unthinkable. But what next? Should society be accelerating adoption of a universal basic income paid regularly to all citizens? To discuss that idea and some related and alternative options, I am joined in this webinar by a number of panelists, each of whom brings a distinctive, important perspective. I ask them now to briefly introduce themselves, starting with Phil Tier. Hi, David. Hi, everyone. My name's Phil Tier. I, um, I've spent my career in the advertising industry and in the creative industries, working with, uh, with creativity. I'm the author of The Coming Age of Imagination, How a Universal Basic Income Will Lead to an Explosion of Creativity, which is just published a couple of weeks ago. Quite an interesting time to publish a book on basic income. Uh, couldn't quite see this one coming. Thank you. Callum. Uh, hi, my name's Callum Chase. Um, I'm a speaker and writer on the subject of the impact of artificial intelligence on our lives. And right now I'm really wishing I'd had the same idea that, this, that Phil did and brought my book to, uh, to wave at you. Um, I've written a couple of books on, well, a few books on AI. The main ones are Surviving AI and The Economic Singularity. And The Economic Singularity is about uh, whether UBI is, is a good solution to technological unemployment or whether there are better ones. Um, I wrote my first article about technological unemployment in 1980. And probably the most significant feature of that article was that it was very wrong. Uh, I, I was very wrong about the timeline to technological unemployment. And that taught me to think very carefully about and specify uh, the timeline when you're making forecasts about technology. Thanks, Colin. Barb? Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I have been running uh, Basic Income UK for the last seven years, and uh, I've also been in, very involved with uh, Unconditional Basic Income Europe. So, yeah, I've been doing a lot of basic income organizing, and of course, in the last two weeks, it's certainly increased exponentially, I must say. Karen? Hi, my name is Karen Isim, and I'm the co-founder of the Future of Governance Agency, which works with UBI as one of several of the new governance tools, uh, which we could use to upgrade our institutions. And I've previously uh, been the executive director of Global Challenges Foundation, where I ran specifically governance competition to look at governance of global risks. And where are you connecting from today? Uh, from today in Amsterdam. Thanks. And uh, Janadi. Thank you. My name is Janadi Stolyarov II. I am the author of Death is Wrong, the children's book on indefinite human life extension. I'm also the chairman of the United States Transhumanist Party. The U.S. Transhumanist Party supports uh, putting health science and technology at the forefront of American politics, and we have an extensive platform that has been generated by our members through multiple rounds of voting. Universal basic income is part of that platform and currently we are voting on a series of measures that we are going to propose in response to the COVID-19 crisis, which will include an emergency universal basic income for all Americans. Thanks all. So each panelist will shortly give a slightly longer version of the opening ideas. But before then, I'm going to do an experiment. 
I think there should be a poll on the screen now, and it gives you the chance to indicate your initial views. Are regular income payments to every citizen in the country a good solution to the fragility that the coronavirus pandemic is exposing in our economy and basic social net? Yes, no, or unsure? Not seeing a poll. Uh, what do I need to do to make this poll visible? Nobody's seeing a poll at all. So much for that. It says attendees are now viewing questions. Well, that's a bit of a shame. Well, this software isn't working. So we'll have to work without that initial poll or indeed another one I'd prepared and I'll have to figure out afterwards why that didn't work. In that case, uh, start hearing uh, views from each of the panelists. And by the way, feel free if there's a question that comes to mind based on what you've heard that you believe needs to be fed into the conversation, raise that in the question and answer box. So Phil, more about your views on this, please. Thank you, David. Um, so I mean, the, the, I mean, the question is, is the concept of universal basic income a wise response or a naive distraction to the challenges posed by COVID and likely future disruptions. I mean, Ian Duncan Smith, the um, conservative UK politician said the other day that the problem with basic income is that it discourages people from working. Firstly, I mean, that's not true. You know, test after test of basic income has shown that the guarantee of income, no stretch attached, no strings attached, actually encourages people to work more. People work more because they have hope of a better life. They can have dreams. The same as rich people work, you know, and rich people will have careers and businesses. However, in these circumstances, in these particular circumstances that we're in, in this disruption, we don't want people to get to work. In this instance, I'd say a guaranteed no strings attached income would mean people could stay at home confident they'll not end up in abject poverty in the middle of this um, virus outbreak. What I wanted to, to do was to imagine we've had a universal basic income in place for a while now. Imagine it's been in place since before COVID-19. So what difference would that have made to the situation we're in today? It may have meant that we would um, have been able to get into lockdown quicker because people wouldn't be waiting around for the Chancellor to come up with an economic plan to protect their companies, their income, their businesses, etc. It would mean that the self-employed would not have been living with the uncertainty of not knowing whether there would be aid for them, and they would still be going to work as the result of that uncertainty. Some stats published by the RSA, the Royal Society of the Arts this week, 47% of self-employed people and 51% of people in atypical work I say they feel obliged to work even when unwell. And that's this week. The quarter of all renters out there who are worried about being made homeless would not be worried. And neither would the third of those in insecure work who, worried about, who worry about getting made homeless. Nobody out there would be at the mercy of a means testing system that tends to miss out, particularly miss out, on those who are already on low and middle incomes, the sort of people who are going to need support fast. A means testing system that is slow by design because it's designed for one purpose, to get claimants out of the system and back to work. And that is not a purpose that we need a system to do at the moment. Basic income is about individual agency and choice. It's about individuals being able to choose to protect themselves and those around them, rather than waiting for employers or governments to make that decision for them. So it's a very, in that sense, it's a very wise choice. At the moment though, we're talking about basic income as an emergency measure. An emergency basic income is a phrase that's been trending on Twitter. And it's a good idea. It's a good idea because it puts, gives, gives money to people right away when they need it. But I believe we should consider it as something more than emergency relief, no matter how important that relief is. Because 
and this and this is still related to COVID and still related to this event that we're in the middle of. It is likely that many things will change as a result of what we're going through now. It's likely that the nature of work will change through this period. Technology, as we're using it right now, we're using the te technology right now. Technology has stood ready to automate many aspects of life, of work, of industry for a while, but it's been stuck on the wrong side of an adoption curve chasm, waiting for its big push into the mainstream. Now that nobody can leave the house to go to work, the push is here, the opportunity is here for that technology. In China, unmanned supermarkets were launched in COVID areas and they are now become, they're doing really well and becoming a new normal. As are drone deliveries, we've talked about drones. Amazon have done PR stunts around drones, but drones are being used in China now to actually deliver things. Driverless transport may be next. Online shopping is, is growing. Online shopping, I think, is massive, but online shopping for supermarkets in the UK whatever, is not that big. In China, in the last three months, online supermarkets flourished, often employing the staff let go by the hospitality and restaurant sectors. Already here in the UK, supermarkets are on a hiring spree, and that may make a dent on the millions who signed on as unemployed over the last couple of weeks. It's likely that another outcome of this crisis will be an economic shift in production away from people to machines and bots and algorithms and software. And when that happens, the most valuable asset we as humans will have is our capacity to care and to imagine. And the new world will value our creativity much more than the old world, in the same way as the old world valued our productivity. The culture of work will change. The homework and technology we're using now um, has been, like with Zoom, has been kicking around for a while. But shares in Zoom, this uh, rocketed last week, as video con conferencing crosses that chasm into mass usage. As we are developing, as we develop ways of working remotely, companies, big and small, will start to question the need for their premises and their offices. Already corporations like major banks tend to have in their headquarters desk space for about half of their HQ staff. That trend will continue and it will spread. GPs doing consultations by video call, that will continue too. It's much more efficient. Now, 30 seconds. Involved. Sorry. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay, so I, I'll jump to, I'll say we're seeing dolphins swimming in Venice canals and pollution clouds dissipating over China. So we're seeing a connection be made between us not going out and the climate getting better. The less work, the less we pull out. So I'd conclude that, I'll just jump to the conclusion that you, basic income is a wise choice in the short term in terms of making it possible for people to survive at home without work. And it's an even wiser choice in the long term as we try to rebuild in a world with a smaller economy in dire need of growth where automation is sweeping the old world of work aside and we will need more than ever an explosion of creativity. So basic income could save lives now and it could be the foundation of a new age, a kind of age of imagination. Thanks. Many thanks, Phil. We've already had one fact check in the text window. Wendy Grossman says that the dolphin story was a hoax. Wow. <laughs> we can do some more checking on that as we go on. Callum, what's your views? UBI is a, a very old idea. It goes back to at least uh, Thomas More in his book Utopia in 1516. Uh, and is most commonly advocated in connection with technological unemployment or the prospect of technological unemployment. And uh, it is now, of course, being recommended in connection with uh, mitigating the economic impact of the coronavirus. It's also championed by people who simply dislike capitalism or think that they can magically remove inequality by raising taxes on people who are richer than themselves. Oddly, those people almost never seem to set an example by voluntarily paying higher taxes themselves, even though they're almost always in the top 5% of global income and wealth. I'll say up front that I think that technological unemployment is coming, although not for two or three decades. 
And I do think we need to figure out a, a new type of economic system to cope with it. I'm not going to spend any time arguing that case because I suspect that pretty much everyone in this meetup agrees with that. David asks for provocations, and I always try to do what David asks. Uh, so here's my provocation. I'm probably going to be the most unpopular person in this, in this uh, panel. UBI, I think, is two thirds of a bad idea. It consists of three things, universal, basic, and income. Universal is a bad idea. Basic is a really bad idea. Income is a good idea. My job is giving keynotes at conferences. And when I tell business audiences that technological unemployment is coming, their first concern is almost always, how will people find meaning in a world without work? And I don't think that is the major problem. I think that when machines do all the jobs, humans will do whatever we want to do. And this will be a really good thing. I think we could well have a second renaissance. In fact, I think the people who insist that we will always do jobs are pessimists. The challenge from technological unemployment is not meaning but income. So that's the part of UBI that's a good thing. Universal is a bad idea. In a world of scarce resources, paying people who don't need it is wasteful. To make this more graphic, these people include Rupert Murdoch, Nigel Farage, Dominic Cummings, and Silvio Boresconi. There is a good reason for making some welfare payments universal, which is that if you don't, some people don't claim them, either because they don't know about them or because they're too proud. UBI is not that sort of payment. It's generally intended for situations where without it, you starve. Basic is a really bad idea. As an emergency response to the virus, it might be the best we can manage and it's temporary. Although it's interesting that every government so far is implementing target, targeted policies rather than UBI. But if and when technological unemployment arrives, it will be permanent. And if the best a society can do for most of its members is to make them poor forever, then it's failed and it probably won't survive. And the reason why <coughs> UBI is basic is because as pretty much any economist will tell you, it's unaffordable. As John Kay put it, if UBI is high enough to be useful, it's unaffordable. If it's affordable, it's not useful. Now, fortunately, I think there is a kind of economy in which it would be possible to transfer sufficient income and wealth to those who need it, i.e. most of us, and that is the economy of abundance. This is an economy where the prices of all the goods and services that you need for a very good standard of living are almost free, but they're not entirely free. So here's some more of the provocation that David asked for. Unlike a lot of advocates of UBI, I am not anti-capitalist. I am not advocating what is becoming known as fully automated luxury communism. I think competitive markets are a very good thing. Technology and capitalism have together made the 21st century by far the best time ever to be born a human, certainly the best time ever to be facing a global plague. The failure to recognise that basic fact underpins a left-wing populism, which could be every bit as dangerous as the ugly right-wing populism, which gave us President Pinocchio and Silvio Berlusconi. The economy of abundance is illustrated by Spotify. A couple of years ago, a couple of decades ago, sorry, no one could afford access to all the world's music. It would have cost billions. And now it's 10 pounds a month. The world will become more and more digital, but we also need to develop Constructify and Clothify. And I think we can do this by making all production processes much more efficient. And this requires three things. First, we need to enlist more and more advanced AI in the drive to improve efficiency. Second, we need to drive down energy costs close to zero. And third, we need to remove expensive humans from as many production processes as possible, i.e. we need automation. So because we need the economy of abundance, we shouldn't resist automation. In fact, we should accelerate it. And during the accelerated job churn phase, which precedes technological unemployment, the slogan should be automate and redeploy, rinse and repeat. I don't have a crystal ball and the economy of abundance is at best a hypothesis. I think a lot more serious attention 
should be paid to planning our journey through the churn towards technological unemployment, what I call the economic singularity. If we are smart and perhaps a bit lucky, I think we can arrive at a very good destination. We could call it fully automated luxury capitalism. Fully automated luxury capitalism. Well, there's a, a new one for the book. Uh, we need a new abbreviation for it. So th many thanks, Callum. A couple of uh, housekeeping points before we move on to Barb. Those of you using the text chat, you may be misled by the default in there. The default there seems to be to send the questions and comments just to the panelists. If you have something you want to share with all the attendees, you have to click on the to button and say, send it to all attendees. I think you can do that rather than just having your wisdom coming to us panelists. The second bit of housekeeping is that thanks to Rohit and Dean Bubbly, there are a couple of I think good questions already in the Q&A window and we'll see these accumulate and then we'll come to them in due course if they haven't been adequately covered. I guess the third thing I should say is after all the panelists have finished their opening five to seven minutes, I'll give each of them one more minute to comment on what they've heard from each other before we then move open. Having said all that, Barb, what would you like to add to the conversation? Okay, hey, um, maybe the best thing I can do here is uh, talk about the current situation and uh, why we've been advocating for an emergency basic income right now. I mean, I just want to say that if we had a basic income in place, I don't think that we would see anything like the kind of fear and panic that we've seen in the last couple of weeks or so, particularly with the panic buying, um, especially if people don't, you know, if they don't know whether they're going to have an income in a couple of weeks or at the end of this month. And, um, you know, people tend to buy the things they're going to need, you know, while they still have the money. I think there's been about 500,000 people who've tried to apply for universal credit, which is the unemployment benefit here in the UK. And they're looking at not being able to complete those claims until June. Now, I just want that to sink in. And also the government today just announced a package for self-employed people, which will also not kick in until June. And I'm just wondering whether the government thinks that people will become breatharians if we can be super futurist in this, um, you know, in the meantime. So, I mean, I would definitely make a case that basic income would be the, the fastest and easiest way to get money to everybody who needs it. There's a uh, scheme in, in South Korea where one of the provinces there has um, actually issued an emergency, they call it an emer emergency income, actually, uh, which they've just put, they've just made cards and they, you know, you get a card based on your national insurance number. So it would be very easy to deliver without sort of messing around with different, you know, the uh, Department of Work and Pension systems or the tax system. And also, I think even going forward, if we can keep that, it also keeps it completely separate from uh, somebody, you know, your savings or anything else, you know, again, from the tax system or from the benefit system. So it could really truly be a payment that that's on top. And in fact, that would be the simplest thing to do. You just go in, you show your ID, you show your, you know, something with your national insurance number, and you get a card which is loaded on whatever amount of payment. Also, just to answer some of what, what Colum said, which I thought was really useful. I also don't like the term universal basic income either. All right. I'd much rather see it as a dividend, that is a right that everybody has to a share in the economy. My personal reasons for supporting it all these years has, has been mainly around um, the issue of care. I think uh, what we're finding out right now in this crisis is who is actually necessary for, to the functioning of society, i.e. people who are unpaid or low paid or in extremely insecure, you know, have extremely insecure incomes. And the people that are paid the most, actually, we don't really notice that they're gone. So, you know, I hope that, you know, at the end of this crisis that, you know, we will have somewhat of a rejigging of, you know, how we view the world, how we function in the world. I really do also think that, that the government, you know, by the end of this, I don't know when they think this is going to end. I'm very suspect that, you know, the fact that they've said that self-employed people can't get any money until June means that they think that this will be over and they won't have to pay out, all right, by that time. So this will have much more long-reaching long effects. And I would really ask people, you know, if you don't agree with an emergency UBI right now, what would be the alternative? Um, 
I'm really, you know, I'm sitting here in central London looking at a real prospect of, of riots and mass looting in the next, you know, say two or three weeks when people aren't able to deal, you know, they're, either their employers haven't paid out their, you know, the money that they were supposed to, or people haven't been able to get on universal credit, or they've not been able to draw down these other things. I think it is a really serious situation and you can see it with the shopkeepers. Uh, those that are not open are having to pull everything out of their windows and they, some of them and the ones on Oxford Street have actually taken their branding down. That's how worried they are. I think we can avoid that. I think basic income would be a very good way to, you know, an emergency basic income would be a very good way to avoid that. And hopefully, obviously, I hope that it would continue. I think it would be very difficult to take away once it started. So thank you for this, and um, I'll also be happy to answer questions later. Many thanks, Barb. Uh, Karen, uh, what would you like to bring to the conversation? I am going to actually share my screen, if that is possible. Can you see this? Surplus, it says. Yes, because that is exactly what I'm going to uh, focus in on, because I think that is indeed the key to understand any society's design. Um, and the fact that we have societies where not everyone who is a part can be a part of creating what is needed to support the community. Some are too young, some are too old, uh, or in other ways unable, as so many of us are right now. Um, and therefore, in every society, you have some people or entities that need to produce a bit extra, which is this, the, the magical surplus, so that there is enough for everyone to go around. Karen, and you may then, need to hold yeah. the microphone away from your body. It seems to be rattling. Yes, thanks. Is this better? Wonderful. So then the question is, for every society, who will be asked or forced to produce that surplus? And that's half the question that every society construct answers. And the other one, of course, is how is that surplus distributed? Where do the reserves go? Who owns them? Who gets to eat, so to speak? And then lastly, of course, we need strong narratives to say that the current way of producing and distributing surplus is the best, or even that it is the only possible way. And so I will move now to a very famous quote that I'm sure many of you have seen by Milton Friedman, only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. And that is where I think many of us believe that we are now. We are in a situation where it is becoming very clear that our current model is not the only option, nor is it right now possible. And this way, the way that we are so dependent on now of producing and distributing surplus is extremely young. And I think we should remember that. Callum talked about uh, that it's also been extremely effective, but just in terms of not thinking of this as the, the end of history, I think we learned that lesson, that that's not um, a reasonable position to, to take, that this would be as the best that we could do. So if we squeeze all of human history into just one hour, all the 200,000 years that we have existed, then this way of constructing our economy would have only been um, here for four years seconds. So this is a very, very young system, and it would be absurd to think that it is the last iteration. And so just like in the Friedman quote, in the time of crisis, here we have people finding a UBI, which we can see here, the left graph that you see is in the Google searches for UBI in the last couple of days. And the right on the right side, you see the unemployment um, going um, up extremely quickly. And uh, so clearly these two uh, might have some uh, correlation to one another. Um, what we also have is, of course, the few, the very few experiments when it comes to UBI and the effects that have been observed. These are very positive things, um, in tangenting uh, things. That Karen, many... sorry yes. to interrupt one more time. Is it possible to make your slides a bit larger? I believe so. I can also share them afterwards if anyone is interested. Yes. Observed effects. Can you read that better? 
I can see that better, yes. Fantastic. Wonderful. What we have here is, is very promising. Um, not, it doesn't really tell a tale of what people would do because it's not strong enough. The evidence is still very, very weak. Um, but we see sort of a whisper of that people, however committed they are to their professional identities right now, if given some time to settle into a new normal, find other identities, other ways of make, making life interesting. And it also, of course, gives us uh, interesting answers as to who can create the surplus in relation to the impending automation, whether or not that is coming very quickly or is somewhere into the future. Um, right now, we, we know very little, and I think we should be honest about that. We know very little about what the effects of UBI uh, would be. Uh, to do something um, to this effect right now would be an experiment. But I think that is where we can also be honest about every single policy that is being effectuated right now is an experiment too. There is no status quo anymore to defend. And that is where this window of opportunity opens. It's not possible anymore to say that something new is irresponsible because everything in this situation is unprecedented. And then lastly, I think one of the most interesting things to consider right now is the fact that people are stuck at home, but they're not stuck at home doing nothing. They're stuck at home watching, scrolling and watching and observing what their leaders are doing. But not only what the leaders in, in one's own territory is doing. We all see, for example, how South Korea and Singapore handled the early stage of the crisis. And, and in that same way, we're seeing and sort of being able to hold the flame to the feet of, uh, of leaders by, showing, by, by knowing what leaders are doing in other places. And so we've seen it now when it comes to medical care, but the next step, the, the inevitable step when it comes to the very riots that Barb talked about could be so close upon us, is who will take the leadership in terms of economic policies that will either calm people down or make people very angry. And that opportunity to also realize injustices that might have actually been in place for a very long time, but where we can now see so clearly, and um, we have time to reflect about injustices that have been there for a long time. We see the different um, very wealthy people who are offering care packages of different kinds. Uh, this image shows uh, individuals who have larger wealth than the GDP of each of these countries. Those kind of things have an opportunity now to sink in. And that's why I would argue that for any leader who is interested in keeping the current system afloat in any way, there needs to be something that shows that we're not giving uh, banks, bailouts, and essential workers applause. It's, it's, it has to be something that shows that it's not a matter of this, what Nassim Taleb today and, and yesterday have been calling this corporate socialism. It's, it's an opportunity for leaders to show whose side they are actually on because people are watching and people are not being as stressed with their ordinary lives as they normally would. And for that reason, I think in terms of managing the emotions of populations, that is something to, to take extremely serious in terms of systemic effects as well. So in, in conclusion, to me right now, UBI is immediate and necessary for for many reasons. And the big question is who, which state will take these steps and take leadership first? Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks, Karen. Plenty to think about there too. Before we have a wider discussion, let's say uh, hear what the final panelist has to say. Gennady. Thank you, David. And thank you everyone for attending this session. Uh, I would like to begin by discussing the ongoing proposal for consideration by the U.S. Transhumanist Party on an emergency universal basic income. We are currently in day two of our three-day voting period, and I just posted a link in the chat to our question three on our ballot pertaining to section E8B on an emergency universal basic income. The option 
which seems to be receiving the most traction thus far among our members is option EAB2, which reads as follows. The United States Transhumanist Party supports for an immediate universal unconditional basic income of at least $1,000 per month to be provided to every United States citizen for the duration of the COVID-19 outbreak and its immediate aftermath without regard for individuals' means or other sources of income. The priority for this program should be to prevent massive and irreparable economic disruptions to the lives of Americans in the wake of the COVID-19 epidemic. Now, I would note this proposal stands in dramatic contrast to the stimulus package that has been negotiated in Congress. The stimulus package that has been negotiated in Congress does provide some one-time monetary payments. They would be $1,200 to many Americans, but not to all Americans. Indeed, many middle-class Americans are excluded from the proposal that the Republicans and the Democrats have hammered out after much partisan wrangling. Indeed, people earning even more than $76,000 a year, which is a kind of middling middle class income, are going to start getting those benefits phased out until uh, an income of $99,000 per year is reached, at which point people earning that income or more, who are not wealthy individuals by any stretch of the imagination, these are also middle class people, uh, typically knowledge workers, uh, in some coastal cities in the United States, that's not enough to be able to afford an apartment, and yet those people would be getting nothing. And I see severe problems with the approach that Congress has taken, because that is a recipe for essentially class resentment, class warfare. If the basic income payments, for whatever reason, are not universal and not unconditional, then it is very easy to perceive them as redistributive, particularly if tax increases on certain segments of the population are used to fund payments to other segments of the population. But another enormous problem with means-tested payments of any sort is that they are administratively burdensome. And in a crisis such as this pandemic, it is imperative to get relief out to people as rapidly as possible, which means the closer you can get to a system which asks the question, do you exist? If yes, are you a citizen uh, or permanent resident of the country in question? If yes, you get the check, you get the same check as everyone else. That is the system that works best. It has worked well in Alaska. Alaska has a small oil dividend that it pays to each of its residents, about $2,000 a year. And that is analogous to a small UBI, which is highly popular in Alaska precisely because it does not differentiate along class lines. And I would further say the millionaires and the billionaires comprise a tiny fraction of the portion of a given population. If each of them were to get $1,000 per month, that would be a drop in the bucket compared to the massive administrative savings that would be achieved, which would allow for a larger UBI payment to be provided to the rest of the population. Finally, I would point out there are means to fund a universal basic income other than raising taxes. And uh, this idea was pioneered by Zoltan Istvan, who was the founder of the U.S. Transhumanist Party, but it has very much been extrapolated upon by Yohanan ben Zion, who is our 2020 presidential nominee. And this idea is the federal land dividend, especially in the Western United States, immense swaths of land are federally owned and completely unused. They're not even national parks, national monuments, scenic sites. I can understand the desire to preserve those and keep them pristine. But much of it is just barren scrubland, which could readily be converted to agricultural or industrial activity or used to build habitation. So the idea of a federal land dividend is to actually lease out all of that land to private corporations subject to certain environmentally friendly stipulations. So they may not pollute the land, they may not despoil it in any way, and they have to give it back in some a reasonable condition after the lease expires. But the proceeds of 
that leasing arrangement could be used to fund a universal basic income. And keep in mind, in some Western US states, more than 50% of the land is federally owned and completely unused. In Nevada, where I reside, it's more than 80%. So if you could put that land to work, if you could put industry onto that land, the calculations performed by our candidate, Johanan ben Zion show that it is possible to afford a universal basic income, not just $1,000 per month for every American, but $1,000 per week. That is $52,000 per year. That is not a poverty level income. That is a kind of lower middle class income, uh, which serves as a floor. Now, another important reason for UBI to be unconditional is because we do not want to have those disincentive effects of people being discouraged from seeking employment or self-employment or other sources of income. A UBI is intended to give people some breathing room. It's intended to give people some room to experiment if their first venture doesn't work out, if their foray into a new career doesn't work out, they are not going to be in dire straits. But we do want people to contribute in other ways. We want people to seek other sources of income. Uh, I am more along the lines of supporting fully automated luxury capitalism than fully automated luxury communism. So in my view, a UBI is a motivator toward fully automated luxury capitalism, because if the pressure for mere survival is taken off from an individual, the higher level creative faculties kick in, a person rises on Maslow's hierarchy of needs and is able to be more entrepreneurial, is able to be more self-determined, and there is no upper limit to how far an individual can go in terms of productivity and income if those basic needs are met. So those are my thoughts on universal basic income. If you're a member of the U.S. Transhumanist Party, please check your email, go and vote on our emergency proposals. We have 20 proposals besides the emergency UBI as well as to how to address the COVID-19 epidemic using a technological orientation and essentially fighting a major war against this virus as well as against all disease more generally. Many thanks, Janadi. So I'm going to give the panelists another minute each if they have things they want to respond to based on what they've heard from each other. So we'll go around in the same order again, starting with Phil and then Callum and so on. And I'm also going to try at the same time to use another aspect of this Zoom webinar software to promote briefly as a new panelists, a couple of people who have asked a lot of questions and got a lot of upvotes that is Rohit Talwar and Dean Bubbly. So you guys might find yourself briefly changing your nature. So while I do that, Phil, would you like to comment? I think it's Alan Baddy or Alan Badieu, Alan Baddy or whatever, the French kind of philosopher said um, something like, we are defined by how we react to random event events. Random events define us. You know, the Second World War defined the generation that came out of the Second World War. It, and it set the tone for the sort of the 50s and the 60s. And 1968 defined the generation. And I think this, this is, will potentially be the event that defines us and defines everything that we do sort of afterwards. And I think we have an opportunity here to lay some foundations for a different kind of society. And I don't, I don't know about, you know, fully automated luxury capitalism or communism. I think the two, capitalism and communism, might be slightly irrelevant there. A fully automated luxury lifestyle would be a pretty good thing one way or the other. Um, I think the real issue here is about whether you put people first and hope the economy gets better, or you put the economy first and hope people are okay. And I think the general tendency so far is to, be, is to put the economy first. So to hope that we get through it quickly, to hope that we can get back to business as usual, and not to overcommit to sort of um, giving people too much support, et cetera, et cetera. I think if you put people first, and a universal basic income is a great way of doing that, you tap into the very thing that makes the economy work which is the industry and the imagination and the creativity of people. Markets don't create themselves and venture capitalists don't create markets. 
people create markets and they create it with ingenuity and with imagination and with their innovation and their skills and they come up with new ideas and they build and they get supporters for those ideas and they build markets out of those ideas. And when you put people first, the economy will benefit as a result. Thanks, Phil. Callum, any rejoinders? I don't think any of the other panelists answered the really important question of how we would pay for universal basic income. I mean, I think we're all in favor of giving people as much money as we possibly can. The more money we all have, the, the happier we are, the more choices we have, the healthier we are, the more things we can do with our lives. That's all great, but you know, how are we gonna pay for it? Also, I'm surprised that nobody's addressed this, this issue. I saw, I think it was Dean said something in, the, in either the Q&A or the chat, that the problem with universal, maybe it was Rohit, the problem with the universal payments is you end up giving it to people who really don't need it. And I would really be appalled if our taxpayers' money was going to Rupert Murdoch. You know, that man shouldn't, I, I, I don't, I try very hard not to give that man any money at all. And I certainly wouldn't want any taxpayers' money going to him. I couldn't disagree more with Phil about the idea that fully automated luxury capitalism or communism are indistinguishable, the same, or the choice between them is irrelevant. It, it is a terrible old cliche, but it's true that capitalism works and communism doesn't. Economies are what makes it possible for us all to have the goods and services that we need to have a good life. So it, it, it is not a trivial thing what type of economy you have. It, it dictates a lot uh, of what kind of lives we have. But the single most important question I'd like an answer to is what on earth is that background, Gennady? I think you, are you a superhero in, in Gotham or are you fighting against the evils of Mordor? It's fantastic. So if I may Let's answer, hold on I... to that. Let's hold on to that. We'll have to suspend our uh, imagination for a minute. Barb. I mean, in terms of how to pay for it, I think the transhumanists have a really good idea in, you know, by leasing the land, you know, that's held in common and, and paying a dividend from that. I mean, that, that idea dates back to Thomas Spence, I believe. I don't know if you guys know about that. But um, he also proposed that, that land be held in common and then be leased out and that the proceeds would then go out to the community, uh, both for infrastructure and also for a payment to each, each individual. I really wonder about this, how can we afford to pay for it thing? I, I mean, first of all, because money is something that, that it's the only resource that humans actually create for themselves. There's no need for any other resource. We just create it, whether it's, you know, shells or whether it's paper or whether it's, it's uh, ones and zeros on a screen. I mean, they've, they've basically said that that's what they're doing now. I mean, whether that's in the US or in this country or in other countries, they're basically just creating the money in order to, you know, bail out who they feel like bailing out. And the thing is, it's like, I don't understand why. Well, I do kind of understand in certain ways, but, but I don't really understand why they feel the need to kind of keep all these divisions between people. I mean, for me, the reason that we, you know, we give money to rich and poor alike is that we want everyone to feel that they're a citizen of this society. And if Rupert, you know, Rupert Murdoch, you know, whether he gets his thousand pounds a month or whatever we win on this or 80, 80 quid a week, I don't really care. He will be paying much more of that in tax. I think there's been a real problem in the last 40 years. The taxes on unearned income have fallen way below the taxes on working. So, I mean, people that are talking about, well, there's a moral hazard, people wouldn't work or whatever. You know, on the one hand, that seems to only apply to people who have to work to, in order to earn a living. And it doesn't seem to apply to the people that already have money coming in, either through family or through dividends or through intellectual property or all the different ways that people can, you know, basically sit there and, and get money, um, you know, without doing anything at all. And, you know, and further to that, there are a lot of people who actually have money and don't need to work, who I really wish would just stop working and leave us alone. All right. I mean, there's, you know, there's that, there's, you know, the way things have been bumbled by this government, I, you know, the crisis that they don't even realize that they're bringing us to, I find it absolutely unimaginable. I think, you know, basic income and emergency basic income would be very easy to do. Other, other places have shown the way, whether that's South Korea or Singapore or the, you know, 
Rashid Tlaib's bill in the U.S., which unfortunately didn't get passed with their with their package. Um, you know, because you know, of course, before this crisis, a lot of people were already in emergency. I had some very funny conversations with people from from Extinction Rebellion. You know, and they're going on with their hair on fire about how we're all going to die in in ten years or five years or whatever it is. And I'm like, well. There are people who don't know whether their existence is going to continue from day to day, whether that's people who are in war-torn countries, whether that's, you know, the homeless on the streets that we have everywhere at the moment. I could go on, but I, I won't. I'll leave it there. <laughs> right. Many thanks. We'll come back later on. Uh, Karen, any points you want to clarify? Firstly, I'd love to, um, to build on, on what Barb just said. I've seen a meme go around quite a lot, like, let this moment radicalize you. And I think it's, it's very interesting to think about what radical means, like this, this will to change society at its core, which is something, of course, very potentially dangerous, because the way that we have, uh, the way money is, uh, works is that it is built on belief but it is built on stable belief, which is why it's so threatening to, to have radicals or to see radicalism because it, um, it disturbs or it threatens that stability of belief. And our, our money, our economic system, our laws, they only work if we have stable belief. And that can sound like a very simple thing, but it's difficult to engineer that. And it's been engineered over quite a long time even if it's a short time in the in the greater scheme of of history it's um the question is how much stable belief at this moment can we come up with to believe in something new because clearly there is enough belief to come up with the money to uh, to do the the bailouts that are happening continuously right now but they're currently not bailing out the individual instead the individual is made to bear the burdens of failures in governance which i think we should we shouldn't forget is what brought us here to begin with the fact that we have this virus to begin with is so extremely linked to a governance failure where the allowing of wild animal life farming of wet markets and so on came down to a large extent to lobby groups that wanted to see those markets expand and so i think again we see situations where governance failures um very closely interlinked with support to corporations designing markets in a way that is not primarily beneficial for people. When that fails, the burden is spared by individuals. And that's what I don't think that people sitting back, watching this in their homes will take much more or much longer. Right, many thanks. Apparently it's eight o'clock here in the UK. And apparently there is an opportunity for those of us to express our thanks to the NHS. Does anybody want to mention about it? The street outside has just exploded in noise with uh, my neighbours cheering for the NHS. I can hear some cheers outside my window as well, yes. Random events indeed. Well, can you hear something, Callum, as well? Yeah, so, I'm, I'm pretty rural here, but yeah, there's some, some, distant, some distant celebrations going on. Right. So by all means, you, you, you roar and shout, but perhaps you should put your microphone on mute first so you don't uh, confuse this conferencing system. Janadi. Yes, uh, thank you, David. And first I will answer the question as to my background. This is the City of New Antideath. It is a high resolution digital painting that I commissioned that any of you can find online and download for free and actually have usage rights for free under a Creative Commons license, but it depicts a future society which has essentially resolved all of the pressing problems of our time, including the problem of disease, which the world is grappling with today, as well as the problem of material scarcity of the sort that prevents decent standards of living for all. So this was my attempt to bring into being a depiction of that future society of universal abundance, of decent standards of living for all, and of indefinite longevity for all, hence the city of New Antideath. And that city would not have any problems with its members 
living on a very generous basic income. Uh, it wouldn't be a basic income at that point. Uh, but I wanted to speak a bit more to the question of how to fund it. Of course, I raised the idea of the federal land dividend, which would work very well in the United States and other countries where the government holds large amounts of land. But there are smaller countries or countries that have other resources which are held by their governments, which would be able to harness those resources to supply essentially a sovereign wealth fund. Norway has a sovereign wealth fund that is extremely well capitalized and is capable of funding a lot of the social programs in that country. Saudi Arabia pretty much doesn't have an income tax. Qatar is able to give its citizens uh, very generous payments uh, arising from its oil revenues. But every country has some sort of comparative advantage, either in terms of natural resources or the ability to jumpstart economic production to a much greater extent than exists today. My view as a transhumanist is generally there is far less economic activity, far less technological innovation, far less rapid progress than there could be because there are a lot of artificial barriers to progress in most societies which are still constrained by essentially 20th century regulatory frameworks. Uh, at the point at which the Food and Drug Administration in the United States takes on average 10 to 15 years to approve a new drug or new medical treatment, that is uh, an exponentially slower rate of progress than what we could be experiencing with some relaxation of these restrictions. So if restrictions are relaxed across the board, we could have so much new economic activity that it would be easy to pay for a prosperous basic income for all. Many thanks, Gennady. Let's hear from a couple of people that we have promoted to be panelists. Dean, I mean, you have a couple of questions and thoughts, but uh, why don't you take a couple of minutes to highlight the things you think most relevant? Thanks, David. Firstly, um, I should probably put out my background. Uh, this is my last trip before uh, everything shut down with travel, and that's the formerly communist country of Albania, and that's Skanderberg Square in Tirana, the capital. And I'd certainly exhort people who want to understand the failures of, capital of communism to um, understand what happened in Albania, uh, which for about 40 years viewed even the Soviet Union as amateurish when it came to state control. Anyway, that aside, one of the questions I, I, I put up on the, um, the Q&A was how any form of UBI could be implemented right now. We can have this debate about, is it a long-term vision? Where would we be if we happened to have done it in the past? And what, what if we had it now? Those are hypotheticals. The question is, how long would it take to actually implement either a one-off payment or a series, say monthly payments as an emergency now? You might be able to hack the benefit system or the tax system somewhat, but I know when Rishi Sunak uh, was asked in front of the Treasury Select Committee last week um, about UBI and other things, he said that basically the Treasury had worked through, they'd been given a whole bunch of options and suggestions, and they'd looked at what could actually be done. So whatever you think of the government or even Rishi Sunak, it appears that the civil servants at the Treasury um, have looked at it and came to the conclusion that it would need a lot of work. Now, whether that's weeks, months or years, I'll have to defer to the Treasury. But the impression that, that Sunak gave was it wasn't a quick fix. For and those so, who don't know, those who are dialing in from overseas, Richie Sunak is now our Chancellor of the Exchequer, the person in charge of the country's finance. finances finance minister basically so i think that that's an important question because if it requires a big it project not just to, to sort of hack the existing systems but to onboard new people to um check up on bank accounts and yeah you know, essentially all the sort of usual whether it's not even anti-fraud but just actually making sure it works and there aren't awkward corner cases um for whatever reason that's not a small it project i suspect Separately, I also completely agree with what Callum had to say. I think universality and basicness, well, particularly in the future, leaving aside now, but in the future, if we think that AI and automation is going to get good enough to put everyone out of their jobs, then presumably one of the things it's going to be good enough to do is work out how to allocate resources efficiently. 
Um, and so that being the case, if we've got this world of super AI, why not actually work it out of doing something slightly more intelligent than basicness? I'll leave it there. And before people answer that, maybe Rohit, you can make a few points too in a couple of minutes. Following on from what Dean said, and hello Dean, it's been a while. I think the tax system as it's geared up today is geared up to make payments back to everyone when it gets things wrong and makes a refund. Uh, the benefit system was already can already do that. So we have the basis of this. Yes, there are corner cases, but the people who aren't in one or the other could register. And I think what we found is that the very clever people at the Treasury are trying to find very clever solutions rather than a relatively short term workaround. And then in the background, build the alternative, more substantive long term solution. I kind of find myself agreeing and disagreeing with everyone violently on certain things. I like the idea of a guaranteed basic income as a stopgap measure. Whilst we kind of reskill the economy, people move out of jobs. I'm hearing very different things from the business world that I'm hearing from people like Callum when they're saying it's 20 or 30 years before tech replaces jobs. Pretty much everyone we know in the banking system is now talking 30 to 80% job reduction. They're not- Rohit, maybe you can explain uh, for those who don't know you, how, 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 what, what you do and how you- so I'm a like Callum, I spent a lot of time doing, speaking to corporations. We do research around the emerging future and advisory work. And what we're hearing from everyone is that, particularly with the current crisis, it's really forced them to ask a lot of questions about the work they do. So they're saying how much of what we do is actually essential? How much of the human judgment and human decision making process is really required any, you know, anymore? Could we get the same outcomes in a more automated way? So pretty much everyone I know in the AI world at the moment is overwhelmed with requests to do projects. And I think we're going to see, whether you call it AI or machine learning or just robotic process automation, I don't really care. You're going to see the automation of a lot of jobs in the next year and people taking this as an opportunity to do that. And so I think we're going to see a big lump of unemployment come in the short term. What we don't have is the training to get those people straight back into all the new roles that will come in the new industries that are emerging. So we need some sort of stopgap measure. I think we shoot ourselves in the foot by talking about universal basic income because you're never going to win the argument about paying someone on a hundred thousand or a million pounds a year to give them another thousand pounds a month. It's, it's, you're just going to find it really hard to win the argument. We need to kind of come find a simple model that says this is how you pay a lot of people in the interim a guaranteed sum while they're retraining. I think there has to be a quid pro quo that says you retrain into new skills so you can take responsibility for yourself. You can learn, expand your capacity to navigate, teach everyone what exponential means because we clearly don't get it in the UK. Um, and, and really use this as an opportunity to reset. I don't think you could create a fundamental long-term social policy or economic policy that's predicated on a guaranteed basic income for everyone. And nor would you want to, I don't think. I think it's a temporary measure whilst you reskill the economy. And, and as for the issue of how do we pay for it, you know, we found money to pay suddenly, you know, all the things we're paying out now. We found a huge amount of money to bail out the banks. We've continued that bailout. I mean, we, we've still been paying them something like 30 billion a year since the financial crash in various forms. So we have found the money. And this is a temporary mechanism to get people back into work, to get them learning new skills so they can earn money and become taxpayers. And then it, it, it becomes circular. So you're only talking about this being a temporary fix. I, I don't think we can talk about this as being a long-term solution. I think you need something different there. And it may be, you know, Callum's, I can't remember the words, but luxury capitalism, automated, we're all in there. You know, maybe that's where we get to. But we need a temporary measure now, not in June or next year. Many thanks. So I'll give each of the seven of you 30 seconds 
perhaps 30 to 40 seconds to respond. If you're quick enough, then we can have another round of questions. And I'm going to try and promote two more people into being panelists. That's Wendy Grossman and Tim Pendry. Phil, anything you want to respond to and what you've heard there? I think the big thing, and I think um, sort of um, Rohit picked up on it really well there. Don't look on basic income as a cost. Look on it as an investment. In 2008, we invested massively in saving the banks and saving the, sort of, the money system. We didn't get a lot back for that investment. You know, the banks were intact, but we got austerity. We got 10 years of austerity back for that and very, very little economic growth. Very, you know, so, so little, as small as my interest rate, my savings account. So don't look on it as a cost. Look on it as an investment. And inv Rutger Bregman, who's written a very good book on the subject, called it Venture Capital for the People. Look on it like that. It's an investment in human creativity. Is that a new book by Rutger? No, Is that's it... an utopia for realists. It's not in his... It's a, from two years ago. Yes. It's called Utopia for Realists. The other thing, and just a little one, because it always annoys me, is... Um, do we give billionaires universal basic income? It doesn't even matter. That's the whole point of the 1% and the 0.1% in Cory Doctorow novels and whatever, you know. There's very few of them. There's very few, and we'll get it back off them through tax or they'll spend it. You know, that's not the point. It's given the 99% a lift up out of poverty. So no one lives in poverty again. That's what matters. That's what kickstarts growth. Callum? Replying to Rohit's thing about technological unemployment coming sooner, it is obviously true that there's going to be a great deal of automation in the next year on a curve of exponentially improving computers, improving AI, that's going to produce accelerating autumn. All the people who, are, who lose their jobs will be redeployed because there will be jobs for humans for as long as machines can't take a long time. And, and that's why it does matter, actually, whether it's AI or, or, or uh, robotic process automation. Robotic process automation can replace very, very simple, tedious tasks, and people whose jobs uh, consist of that will, get, will lose their jobs to RPA. But in 20 or 30 years' time, people who are responsible for strategy for large organizations will find their jobs being taken over by machines because at that point machines will be able to do that. It's going to take 20 or 30 years before machines are able to replace almost all the things we do for money. Um, and this thing about whether it matters or not that we give money to rich people, I use Rupert Murdoch as a sort of um, uh, an extreme example, but it isn't just the 1%, it isn't even just the 5%. Uh, the government's just announced that they're going to give two thirds of two and a half grand or to replace self-employed people's incomes up to £50,000 a year. And that's way below uh, the top 1%. So it really does matter whether you decide to try to give money to absolutely everybody or whether you target it to people who really need it. And I think we should, if resources are scarce, we should target it at people who really need it. And the idea that it's okay to give money to rich people because you just claw it back from taxes, that's an insane thing to do. To give £1,000 okay. to and just claim it back is just mad. Barb we should be targeting rather than uh, looking after everyone. Okay, well, the thing is, all right, as someone who's worked in the benefit system for a long time and with people claiming and having been a claimant myself, the problem with, with targeting is that it doesn't actually reach its targets. In this country, depending on the benefit that you're getting, between 20 and 60% of those people eligible for those benefits do not, do not get them or claim them. People who don't have to deal with, with the benefit system don't realize this. Yeah, sorry, words fail me right now, okay, about that, because I think that's something that's completely ignored, all right, by the people saying, oh, well, we don't want to give Rupert Murdoch, you know, a thousand pounds. I would be happy to give him a thousand pounds if he would just really leave the rest of the world alone and go off on his yacht and do nothing for the rest of his life and all of his family with him, all right? And that's not because I'm anti-capitalist. I don't even know what those terms, cap capitalism, communism these days even mean, all right? In terms of tax, again, I have to say, you know, we keep getting mixed up between taxes on, on work and taxes on wealth, all right? What we need is higher taxes on wealth. These have been going down for the last 40 years without anybody saying anything. 
you know, this is another reason for austerity, all right, is that the government, you know, corporate taxes down to, you know, 20% or below, you, you can get rid of, you know, you can get out of uh, paying some income tax by making yourself a company. Again, it's like, we really have to, I think, focus on where the money is in terms of unearned income or wealth that has been inherited. I think it's quite funny sometimes, you know, when I sort of get into online discussions or whatever, and somebody, you know, somebody will say, oh, well, you know, you can't take away Jeff Bezos' right to transfer his company to his sons. And they're actually arguing against basic income. And all I can say is, well, why, you know, why should we not all have part of that inheritance? He built that on, you know, on the work and, you know, by not paying people enough. And now he's talking, he wants a government bailout. And, you know, he's fine with, with people who work and, you know, I've seen their incomes drop, you know, drop to zero, uh, getting nothing. And he's not even paying his workers in Amazon. So it's not about capitalism or communism. It's just about uh, justice. And I think also, you know, I'm, I'm actually getting very away from the, the whole inequality arguments. I think really the real problem we're seeing right now is insecurity. And if we don't want horrible, you know, nationalist populism or whatever, you know, whatever we're afraid of to take over. I think we really need to deal quickly. I was talking about this before this crisis, all right, that, you know, the real problem right now is insecurity. And that actually goes all the way up to even civil servants who are having to reapply for their jobs and become, they have to become contractors now to the government. So they don't even know from one month to the next how much they're going to be making. I think the real problem here is insecurity. We're going to see the problems, you know, with this crisis because of people's insecurity, and we have to do what we can to uh, stop it. Thanks. Karen, 30 seconds. Yeah, just tying into what Troy brought up regarding um, that can have one very immediate response, and then you can work on a larger process later. And I think that is exactly what we should be starting right now. Like, what is the what is the quick fix? And then what is the longer uh, working out all the, all the kinks in the system? Gennady? Yes, uh, I would like to address the question of how to pay for an immediate emergency universal basic income by pointing out Western governments engage in deficit spending all the time. And in many cases on far less worthy causes than assuring the basic economic security of the rest of the population. And while I'm not normally fond of deficit spending, I think in the case of a dire emergency such as this one, where vast segments of the economy have experienced forced closures, it is justified in the short term. Now, all of that deficit spending could be recovered by massively jumpstarting economic activity. The federal land dividend is one idea. Removing restraints on production and research is another idea. Uh, so that at the moment where it becomes safe to do so, vast new enterprises can spring up in a matter of months, if not weeks, just because the previous restrictions, constraints that hamstrung the ability of entrepreneurs to deploy their resources and capital will not be present. That would be my solution, along with major automation to help with uh, that process of major economic development so that we might not need as many people to supply basic needs and there would be greater abundance, less expensive goods and services for people ultimately and a freeing up of human labor into higher order creative occupations. Many thanks. Let's take uh, up to a couple of minutes from Wendy, up to a couple of minutes from Tim, then we'll hear again from Rowett and Dean and anybody else who wants to contribute. Well, I was going to start out by saying to Gennady that I, th I thought the land idea might work in the US, but a lot of countries are very densely settled, but you've, you've kind of answered that. Um, on the other hand, I'm rather disturbed at the notion of Saudi Arabia as a model, given that the only people who actually get that free tax is um, citizen, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of exploitation in the way that Saudi Arabia is set up. They do rely on very poorly paid workers from other countries who then are kicked out of the country as soon as they lose their jobs. I went there and I felt like it was Las Vegas without the soul. 
And if you think about how much Las Vegas doesn't have a soul, it was really disturbing. I do agree with the people who, who say that if you're going to say, well, we're not going to give universal basic income to Rupert Murdoch because he doesn't deserve it, you're going to get into enormous wrangles. And I would predict that one of the first ones is going to be how many children are women allowed to have? How many children can women have who will qualify as adults for universal basic income? I will bet that that's what you'll see. What interests me is that no one has mentioned the thing that I think about and the thing that makes me dubious about UBI, which is the moral hazard to companies. Uh, companies are quite willing to exploit people who have no other source of income. And unless you're going to say, well, people are going to have enough of a universal basic income that they can push back against these companies, I can really imagine a world in which the companies say, well, they're making this money. I don't really need to pay them very much. And that would be my concern. Thanks, Wendy. Tim, you've also got some thoughts on moral hazard, amongst other things. Well, two minutes is not a lot of time to go through all the general concerns, but uh, I'm, a, I'm a supporter of UBI, but as a long-term solution, I think sometimes in this discussion, we've, we've tended to confuse the acute problem and the chronic problem. And I tend to agree a lot with Rohit here. The acute problem is, is, is an issue really of dealing with deflation. You know, at the end of the day, our economies could be smashed by this crisis, not necessarily because of the 1% death rate, but simply because of our reaction to it. And so something that looks like UBI, <laughs> something that looks like UBI, seems to be essential, especially for the um, self-employed. But the long-term concerns are that a number of problems have to be solved, in my view, before you can put it in place. Uh, one is, to be very simple, one is the simple matter of having sufficient productive capacity in order to sustain it. Capital accumulation is, a, um, is not something that happens by magic. It happens, we, we, our industrial revolution was only a couple of hundred, 250 years ago, and it caused a lot of pain and misery. Um, Stalin turned around Russia with a lot of pain and misery. Uh, the next great technological innovation may involve some pain and misery, and making that as just as possible while still permitting the capital accumulation is our big challenge. And the two other issues, very briefly, are trades unionists have legitimate concerns about UBI because of the way it can be used as an excuse to unravel elements in the welfare state, which are those elements that are really very pinpointed to specific vulnerable people. And that's a debate we haven't had at all today and we haven't got time for now, but it is a serious uh, issue of trades unionists and socialists and I think it, there's, a, there's some stuff in the Guardian comment pages in the last couple of years, if you look up UBI in the Guardian, which is well worth reading from that group. And the other is I do think we should take moral hazard seriously. Moral hazard by corporations has been mentioned, and I wholly agree with that. It's a very, very important point. But there is also moral hazard by individuals. Where UBI advocates tend to be a little bit utopian and romantic about human nature. They tend to think we're all going to be as lovely and as intelligent and as creative as each other. Uh, in reality, we have the classic sociopath problem. We have the problem of people of frankly low intelligence who we should care about, but are not often bright enough to cope with complex issues. And you have problems of will, people with mental health or just simply lack of will. And you throw money at these people without preparation uh, too soon and treat them all as equal in a trial of false egalitarianism. And you develop a quite a dangerous situation where large numbers of people are essentially going to follow the instincts of their personality. And I won't go, we haven't got time, but I could go through case studies of where I think that would be very dangerous and could actually result in social degradation. And there's a question in my, in the Q and A, compare it to ancient Rome and the problems of the mob in, <laughs> and the problems of the mob in Imperial Rome. Um, a bit, a bit, a bit obscure. But I you think don't think we have problems of mobs uh, getting angry and uh, frustrated and uh... online, online they're used. They got the riots we've been talking about are bloody trivial, to be perfectly honest. What they are are usually um, events taking place deep in urban, and are usually not to do with income. They're to do with community organisation, and they're to do with the clash between the police as a culture and the community as a culture, often with an ethnic element. It's much worse in America. You see that in the tension which comes from race. Income class 
class is usually expressed in terms of different types of organization, trades unions, political socialist parties, um, much more disciplined. And the essence of the problem we have at the moment, which is why we're in the crisis today, is because we have a two system operation. We have privileged employees in corporations run by manipulative human resources and marketing departments. And we have another world of the gig economy and freelancers and people who, have, um, who are being used in, a, in an appalling way. The, the solution isn't obvious, isn't actually to make everybody employees. That's a bit of an illusion. The, the, the solution is probably to make everybody freelancers and then give them rights and give them the right to be free. And that's when UBI comes in. That's when you give UBI once you've solved all these other problems. As you say, we won't have time to give all these uh, points justice. We must find a way to continue some of this discussion online. Uh, it's half past eight. I'm going to let this run another 15 minutes at the very most. Uh, I'm going to have uh, comments from Dean and then Rohit, if you wish. And I'm going to briefly promote two more people who got their hands up for a very long time in the audience, Alexandra Black and Tony Zaneski. But uh, Dean and then Rohit, maybe 90 seconds each. Okay, I'll, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, a couple of things. One, one term that hasn't been used is helicopter money, which essentially is what we're talking about here in the short term, which is like dropping money from a helicopter. And I think that's, a, that's almost like a one-off event or a, a couple of uh, months, a month uh, of money, rather than UBI, which is an ongoing commitment. And I think it's worth a bit similar to the, the comment about acute versus ongoing uh, we had before i think that's that's a really important distinction to make another thing i would like to to point out is this is often this false dichotomy of people or economy and i think that the two are interdependent fundamentally the economy has to be healthy in order for people to survive on an ongoing basis and it may be we, we end up making some uncomfortable trade-offs between you know short term short term um virus outcomes versus long-term healthcare and social care and affordability of food and everything else. So I'd, I'd, I'd say those, and uh, I think that's probably, oh, actually, you know, one last point, which is uh, worth keeping an eye on the uh, antibody tests that are being looked at for the UK and elsewhere, because if we can prove that people have immunity and can start working sooner rather than later, that solves some of the problems in the short term. That's enough for me. Many thanks. Rohit, 90 seconds. I, I'm with Dean there. I think antibody tests are critical because you can't have a situation where the entire economy is just on pause for three, six, 12 months with no, no exit route in sight. So I think you have to have widespread testing and antibody testing but you still need some sort of stopgap measure that enables people to pay for food, pay their rent or whatever, and just pay their basic bills. Now, maybe that's another opportunity where government steps in with universal basic services and just says, we'll pay a bunch of those things for now. You know, the electricity companies don't charge anyone. We'll just pay you directly. But you could do a few things like that that would be good stopgap me measures. My big concern here is, and I think Tim captured a lot of it really well, we get stuck on this issue around the, the sort of moral and uh, political perspectives on this versus the pragmatic requirements. You know, what are the outcomes we want, which are for people to be able to feed themselves, clothe themselves, house themselves when they don't have an income. And we want to be able to do that in a really easy way. And then we get caught up in all the political debates and, uh, you know, should we do it through taxation? And I think, I think we do have to separate that short-term conversation about what do we do to get us through the next 12 months, but really use this as a test case to say, look, this shows us that fundamental shifts are possible, that we could end up in situations like this again, and we need to come up with a longer-term solution where we've thought through all the elements of it, the mechanisms for paying money, the mechanisms for funding it, and the mechanisms for making sure that we don't end up with unintended consequences like employers abusing workers because they're getting paid elsewhere. 
And I like the idea of everyone becoming a contractor effectively, but then having rights when you go into the workplace and that that's what the government basically enforces is that every employer gives you, you know, additional rights. Um, now I'll, I'll end it there, but brilliant evening. Well done. Thank David. you. Tony, what's your question? What's your well, comment? I have a number of comments to several speakers, but I'll be very brief. Um, my first question is to everyone, why are we discussing right now in the midst of the uh, coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic and how it will impact the, uh, the UBI? In my view, the most important longer term impact is the much earlier start of the technological unemployment, what Cal mentioned, uh, which will trigger off uh, an intensive robotization in many areas, and a sparking off of uh, innovation, which is a very good thing, and unfortunately, perhaps three, four million unemployed within a year. We may have the, the most severe crisis after the war. Callum mentioned uh, several times that UBI is not uh, affordable, that it is unjust because it will be uh, dispensed to people that should never take it, like, like Rupert Murdoch. Well, I would say that this will really be concerning about half a percent or one percent of the population, so it's not a big deal. Now, regarding the question, uh, the, the question of cost, uh, let as a reminder that um, in 2016 there was a, a series of workouts done by several eminent uh, organizations including the Scottish Party, the Green, uh, Green Party, the Labour Party and so on. The average cost of those benefit uh, that would be dispensed in 2016 in those uh, um, terms would be around um, 3% of GDP. Today it will be 2% of GDP. We are talking about 20 extra billion. For that, an average adult would get around 5,000 pounds, a child 2,500 pounds, and the pensioners 8,000 pounds. And of course, it will be taxable. It is affordable right now. And we have to get it ingrained uh, because there will be a much more severe crisis that we will have to expect. Uh, I agree with Callum wholeheartedly that we will be one day living in the age of abundance and luxury capitalism, and that's the way to go uh, forward. The problem is how do we make the transition? And that's what we are talking now. It won't be uh, excellent, it won't be perfect. It is an 80-20 rule, and this is what has been started today, essentially. This is an 80-20 rule, the, the, the most affordable and quickest thing uh, to be done. And the final point is about uh, the, the, the rollout, um, uh, Danny uh, Bubbly mentioned uh, that um, the universal credit already has an element of it in the <laughs> funds that it, it can be done. Actually, uh, Ian Duncan Smith, when he was in charge of the universal credit, in, in initially wanted to, to convert it into universal basic income. He changed his mind. So my final question to everyone is, why on earth the politicians do not want to implement the UBI? I simply do not understand. It should be in their interest. Thank you. Thanks. Alexandria, I think your point you want to raise is somewhat different. I'm much in agreement with Janani on, on just about everything. And we could pay for this with a federal land dividend. But for right now, before we get that going, I think that we should put on credit cards, something like that, a thousand bucks or whatever it is, relief, the relief payment is going to be, relief payment is going to be. Now, this serves several purposes. Okay, they show you their ID, we know who it is, and we test them at the same time. People will come out of their tents for that, trust me. And we can contact trace them. If they hop on a bus to Phoenix, we can, am I here? I've just, Hello? You, you've got a weak connection, so I've canceled your video. Okay. If they move around the country, they can also be traced. Uh, they can be provided funds and we can get them tested. About the uh, crypto wars between China and the U.S., China announced rollout of its cryptocurrency, and the U.S. said, us too. I know they've both been working on them for a while. Uh, the timing of this, I don't know if it's rushed or not. That could be one way to roll it out. 
we could have a hackathon to jumpstart this. So it sounds like you're making a similar point that uh, Tony was in a sense, which is because of the crisis, things are going to be accelerated, which previously might not have happened so quickly. So there might be more incentive to do automation. Junadi mentioned it earlier, in fact, with his discussion of a, a completely unstaffed uh, supermarkets in China and acceleration in use in drones. You're suggesting, Alexandria, that ideas about cryptocurrencies, which have been around for a while, or digital currencies of different sorts, might again be accelerated. Many thanks. Sure. And where, where are you based, just for those who don't know you? Around Atlanta. You are in Atlanta. Many thanks. So I'm going to stop this call in five minutes' time. Let's go around in reverse order this time, maybe just a 20 or 30 seconds of final thoughts. Janadi and then backwards to actually Callum's no longer with us. He apologizes, but Janadi, final thoughts from you, please. Yes. Uh, so I'd like to speak to this moral hazard issue and the problem of corporations potentially mistreating workers who are getting a UBI. I actually think the outcome will be the opposite. People who are receiving a source of income independent of their employer are going to have more bargaining power with their employer because they could afford to walk away if they are not satisfied with the terms. And that may manifest itself in not just a superior salary offered by the employer, but also superior working conditions. Because I think when people look for certain aspects of a job, they're looking for more than just a paycheck. They're looking for a good work environment. They're looking to be respected, valued for their creative contributions. And somebody who does have at least a floor of a basic income would be in a superior position to say to an employer who mistreats them, uh, this is not working out. I am going to try for a different arrangement and I can afford to take a few months to explore and see what I can find. Karen, final thoughts? Yes, just yes, wanted to pick up on a question that I saw in the chat, which is why something, if everything is an experiment, why is this experiment so controversial right now? And I think that's where we have to find our, our identities as digital citizens and see how do we organize and make demands during these kind of circumstances, during digital circumstances. And we don't have uh, that much experience doing that effectively yet. But I think calls like this and, and seminars like this, we're, we're finding our way. How do we make demands? And to, to make that together, I think, can also cause us to, to learn how to do that in other aspects as well. Thanks. Barb? I just wanted to emphasize again that, you know, there certainly is the money around, you know, whether you look at, look at the money supply as a, as a thing that doesn't increase or decrease, but we know that's not exactly true. Okay. The government can come up with money for what it wants. When, when governments go to war, they never ask how much it's going to cost. All right. I, I really don't get that objection. Um, again, with moral hazard, I agree with uh, what Granati just said. Um, you know, that it will give people much more power to bargain, you know, and especially in the kind of work that most people don't want to do. But in fact, we're finding out right now is one, you know, some of the most important work in society, like picking up the rubbish, doing the nursing, um, you know, looking after older people, looking after the kids. I mean, you know, this work, all right, you know, much of it unpaid, but a lot of it, which is very low paid and, and insecurely paid, uh, you know, I think that is what really has to change going forward. Thanks. Phil? It's been a great, it's been a great conversation. I'd like to pick up on the, the universal of universal basic income. And universal basic income is what happens when you take the pre financial insecurity and precariousness out of people's lives. And I think everybody sort of de deserves that. And I think it's not just about the poorest, it's about everybody, it's about the insecurity that everybody feels. And we shouldn't just reward the most creative. Everyone's got a talent, everyone's good at something. Everyone is good at absolutely something. But the universal of universal basic income, it's for the parents who look after children rather than go out to work, it's for people who look after the elderly. You know, it's for, it's for everybody at every sort of level of society has the same opportunity to give back afterwards. That same opportunity that 
wealthy people have. Lots of very, very wealthy people work and run companies and things like that. They do that for a reason. They do that because they get an incredible self sense of self-achievement out of that. Everyone deserves that as well. Thanks. Wendy, do you want to have a final comment? I actually do agree about um, workers having more ability to fight back. I mean, that's the argument I've made about healthcare in the U.S. for years, is that the best way to create a, a generation of pe peasants is to, to, is to tie their health care to, to employment. I'm just very suspicious of the large companies we have now. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So I think if there's a way to game it, they will find it. <laughs> Thanks. Tim, final thoughts from you? Briefly, I, it, I think you know, you know, I've covered this before, is to get away from single issue utopianism about particular policies that we, we love and we want in the long run and try to shift to a much more integrated approach that, that makes where we want to get to feasible because it's the value that matters. And I would get to Phil's fundamental point, which is the ending of insecurity in society rather than concentrating on other issues like re, you know, redistribution or equality. It's ending insecurity and creating the good society because we have enough capital to do it and we have the social organization to do it and we're prepared to spend some time to do it and not try to seize the moment with a, a current crisis and put in something that probably wouldn't work very well, even if we won the argument this time round. That sounds like a theme that's emerging from our discussion, ending insecurity. You know, we transhumanists like to talk about ending aging. Well, ending insecurity belongs perhaps on that list as well. Dean, final thoughts from you? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I, li I like that ending insecurity. And I think that there's a completely separate set of issues and discussions to have about that, whether it's non-universal, non-basic quasi-income, or whether it's universal basic services. But we can have that debate in quieter times now the key the issue is how do we fix the problem here and now and, and frankly i think the rest of it is a is a nice discussion to have in the pub when we can all meet again tony final thoughts from you we don't have time to discuss the the definition what do we mean by certain terms and that's why for instance when when Calum was saying that it's unaffordable what does it in which conditions it is unaffordable talking about universal basic income and saying that it is unconditional doesn't mean that the, the amount of money should be so high that the person could live on it. Not at all, in my view. There should be a separate conditional basic income that might perhaps bring a, a person that doesn't work at all to the level of what is termed today as poverty line. Therefore, the agreement on the terms we are using is, is essential so that we are on the same line. I think generally, as I have been interested in that subject for many years as well, and um, what has come out from the discussions is essentially we have very similar views. There's a measure of government intervention that may be up, up to discussion, but generally we think, I, 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 I may be wrong here, that it is the cheapest way to deliver some kind of justice to people that are in terrible circumstances, and, and we are here all to help. Alexandria, let's see if your connection is strong enough and if you have anything you'd like to offer as closing thoughts. I'm just hoping that we can roll something out very fast. That's why I think that we can do cards and testing together. I hope you look at my link that I dropped in chat. It explains how someone that can work all the time can have no money. Yes, yeah, so we will make the chat available to everyone uh, afterwards too, apart from the private messages. Thanks. Uh, Rohit. I like the idea of ending insecurity. I like the idea of coming up with a practical, pragmatic, fast track solution for what we have now that combines both giving people money to feed themselves, but also doing the testing so that people can get back out into the world. And I think that's important for confidence. But I, I would say that actually now is the perfect time to also be starting the conversation about the bigger picture solution for the future. Because if we don't do it now, we'll forget. In the same way as every time we have a gun incident in the US, every time we have a mass shooting, everyone says now is not the time to think about dealing with the gun issue. And then 
as soon as it's over, people move on and forget. I think right now is when the nations of the world should be talking about how do we do this. The, the two critical groups you need to bring into that conversation, as well as people representing civil society, are the asset owners. The sovereign wealth funds who own, you know, gazillions, you know, is it the state fund of Norway has 1.4% of every company on the planet on, in, its, in its holdings, but they own a massive amount. And then you've got the big pension funds and the other big institutional holders. You need them to be involved because if governments are going to finance this stuff through debt, which they're likely to, you need the people who are going to provide that debt funding to buy in. Now, fortunately, there's not, not many other options for them as to where to put that money right now because the stock markets are incredibly volatile. So now is the perfect time to be having conversations with them about funding the basis of the next economy and tying any kind of income, whatever you want to call it, to retraining for the new sets of jobs that are going to emerge in the new economy. But we're not going to be able to have those jobs if we don't fund the training for them and fund the investment in creating those businesses. So this all ties together in a way we're almost talking about a Marshall Plan for the planet. But do you want to briefly mention the book that you're proposing should be published on the 1st of June? We're not only proposing, we're doing it. So we do a book, it uh, comes out on the 1st of June and it's called Aftershocks and Opportunities, Futurists Envisage a Post-Pandemic Future. And the idea is we want people to give us thousand word views on some aspect of what our post-pandemic future could look like. It could be scenarios, it could be issues that we need to tackle, it could be development timelines, it could be contrarian views. We don't really mind, we want a rich and diverse set of views, everything from how do we sustain the eco ecological benefits of the pandemic through to what are the new economic models, UBI, is AI going to be our master? All of those things, whatever you want. Let me put the web link in the chat and then everyone can see it. Um, Thanks. So now is the time to take advantage of the crisis to ensure that we don't get overcome by even bigger crises coming along. It's the time to build a more resilient society, to have discussions about things that are in many ways different from before. A society in which there's ending of insecurity, society in which we can build on what's happened before. I want to thank all of you for being part of this experiment. We're still not sure the best way to do these online discussions. It's quite clunky having 10 or 11 people on the screen at once. We're going to figure out over time how we can do these online meetings better. I think this was uh, very interesting. I had lots of ideas which I'm going to need to mull over. I think it's going to be the same for all of us and we will figure out how to take this conversation forward in a productive way. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you very much for organizing this, David. Thanks, David. Yeah. Thank you, David. That was great. Yeah, yes. Thank you.